it's great to be here. Today I'm talking about phonology. I hope by the end of the session that you might have found a few ideas that you can incorporate and reflect on over the next while in your teaching, especially in this online world again that we work in where maybe phonology is sometimes harder, even harder to incorporate. I certainly feel that at times. Um, so we're going to look at some ways to, to help us do that, focusing especially on your own coursebook material and the um, schemes of work that you use using Unlock series and using the English Unlimited series. A little bit more of a session overview, I suppose, or a structured session overview would be that we're going to start with some key concepts related to these ideas of phonology that I meant, this idea of phonology, how it might break down, and other key areas within um, phonology and pronunciation as well, of course, which goes hand in hand with phonology. Um, then we're going to look at practical things. We're going to look at ways of integrating more phonology moments, that's what we're going to call them. Um, the session title today is quite long, some of you might have noticed. Um, it wasn't particularly well thought out. And when I did have it, more time to reflect on what I'd like to call it, I think phonology moments in the classroom um, or integrating phonology moments is probably a good, more succinct summary of what we're going to be at today. So we're going to be looking at how to integrate those moments into our reading and listening activities and lessons. We're going to look at how to incorporate them into vocabulary, teaching and development, into grammar and into speaking, of course, with key concepts. The first pair of concepts that I'd like to look at is the idea of receptive and productive phonology. I think using these words like receptive and productive help us be a little bit more precise about what exactly what area of phonology we're dealing with in the classroom. Phonology, of course, is the study or help of helping our learners with the sounds of English. Let's have a little bit of a closer look at what productive versus receptive phonology might mean. Productive phonology is probably the one that I would say most people are familiar with, um, even if they don't call it productive phonology. When we think of phonology, it's probably what we're thinking about. We're thinking about helping learners produce sounds in English, maybe accurate sounds or near accurate sounds, we might call them. That could be individual phonemes. It could be stretches of language, maybe with connected speech or with stress features, weak forms, maybe intonation. This is what we're talking about by producing sounds. Yeah, So using your articulatory system to produce those sounds. And of course, that's connected to the speaking skill or speaking. Um, and being able to produce those sounds is a important component of what it means to speak. It's not the only thing, of course, but it is a, a very important component. And then that, of course, in itself is related in terms of communication, in terms of interaction, that's related to being understood. So they're the things we're talking about in productive phonology. Ultimately, we're talking about comprehensibility. Can we get our learners to the point where they can be understood by other people, whether that be other learners in the classroom, us as teachers, instructors, or the wider English speaking community that they wish to be part of. In the classroom, one of the classic ways that we develop this productive phonology within our learners is that we ask them things like, how do we say this word? Or we focus on what we call pronunciation. Yeah, we, we do maybe call and repeat. So you can see the little picture here. You have maybe the teacher says the word, notices a problem with pronunciation. Let's take a classic word. Recently, I was watching some teachers elementary with the word castle. The learners were saying castle. So the teacher says, how do we say the word? And the teacher says, listen, castle. And the students say, castle. This is a classic call and repeat. And this is focusing on productive phonology. Yeah, we're trying to get the learners to get their mouth around the words or the stretch of language or, or the phrase or the question or whatever it is. In comparison or contrast, you might say, we've got receptive phonology. And receptive phonology is about the listener. 
when we talk about receptive, it's receptive for the learner. So how is the learner understanding? So let's, let's delve a little bit more deeply into that. We're talking about can the learner hear and recognize the sounds that they're hearing? So are they familiar with those sounds, of course, and can they map them onto what the words or the phrases or expressions that the speaker is using? So this is about the ability within the learners or within all of us to map what we're hearing onto what is being said, because we have a kind of repertoire of what those sounds are in English. Yeah, this is our receptive phonology. And it relates directly to our listening skill ability and then our understanding of other people and ultimately our comprehension, I suppose, in a more global sense um, of the word, of what we're hearing and what we're processing in an auditory way. Okay, so this is receptive phonology. So in the classroom, focusing on receptive phonology looks a little bit different than focusing on productive phonology. If productive phonology is ultimately helping the learners produce the sound, receptive phonology is more of a consciousness raising or awareness raising job for the teacher. We're talking about getting learners to listen and identify what the sound, what it sounds like, what something sounds like. We're getting learners to ask teachers or ask other sources to say things or play things again, to sensitize them or develop their repertoire of sounds. So sometimes we think that learners can't understand for different reasons or some we as teachers we're constantly diagnosing why learners can't understand what they're hearing. And one of the possible problems there is that they aren't recognizing and matching those sounds. So helping develop what things sound like, words, phrases, stretches of language in the classroom can help develop their receptive phonology and help them build up their English sounds. OK, so let's go back to some of our key concepts. We had the next one is the idea of agency and the student centred classroom. So I've put these together because I see them in some ways as the same. And it's a key concept today because as we've just mentioned, productive and receptive phonology are about the learner's understanding and being understood in the classroom. So at the centre of that classroom is, of course, our learners, as we know. And when, we come, when it comes to phonology, the movement we're trying to maybe step towards is moving away from the teacher as being the source of maybe the drill or the pronunciation and moving towards what the learners can do and what the learners want to do. So this is what the student-centered classroom means. And agency means maybe giving the learners a little bit more control over their phonological development um, in line with their own needs um, or interests. This is really hard in a massive classroom. We all know that catering to different learners' needs when we're teaching a large class, as I know many of you do. But I hopefully will integrate a couple of ideas on how learners can do this and how we can facilitate them. Next thing, a key concept today will be drilling. And drilling is uh, something we all do in our classrooms. Um, and related to the things we've mentioned above, maybe moving away from just or solely using a teacher call and repeat drill and looking at other ways we can drill in maybe a more student centered way, which will lead to more motivation and engagement with the phonological development of our learners. So we want drilling that's maybe a little bit more personal for our learners, a little bit more tailored to their needs, a bit more engaging. So we're not going to lose their interest, which is always an issue I know with classes, big classes and especially online classes and more effective to lead to better phonological development. So our final concept is the idea that I've already mentioned of phonological or phonology moments in the classroom. What I'm not suggesting today is that you approach all your lessons or all of your um, students as you know phonology being the most important thing it's not it's a tool that we can give our learners and it's a component of their spoken competence and of course their understanding and receptive competence of the English language so what we're suggesting what I'm suggesting is that we integrate small moments that take very little time, maybe a minute, maybe two minutes, sometimes maybe five minutes into what we're already doing in the classroom to help develop this. And these moments can easily be incorporated within your course book material. And I'll hopefully show you how you can do that. Let's start with looking at 
listening and reading. So receptive skills, sometimes they're called. And let's look at integrating phonology with our receptive skills. So Catherine Walter, um, who has done a lot of research into reading and reading skills and what they are and what they are not, has found that, yeah, if we teach phonology, we will help our learners to read better. And this seems a little bit maybe counterintuitive, as she says, students who can't process a text well, an L2 text, for example, your learners in English. One of the reasons, because of an unreliable phonological inventory, which is this kind of repertoire that we talked about, maybe how they're mapping what they're reading onto the sounds. And that means that when they read, and if they can't find in their heads how that word sounds, their understanding of that word, even if they understand maybe the semantic meaning of that word, maybe they've seen it before, but if they can't hear it in their head or in their mind's eye, um, in their internal reading, their understanding of that text is seriously hampered. Now we're not talking about reading aloud here, of course, which is a kind of special reading skill. We're talking about just the general reading and processing of text. What you're all doing now as you read the chat box and as you read my slides is is the reading skill, yeah? It's thoroughly receptive. We're not asking learners to produce anything. And yet, there's a really core component of that skill, which is related to phonology. I find this fascinating. And I think maybe even if we do know it or think about it, maybe sometimes we don't always exploit it in our reading lessons. So here is a little bit of material that you might be familiar with, which is from an Unlock um, Reading and Writing 3. So as the course book suggests, um, the book is focused, the course, the course that you're teaching is focused on reading and writing. So when you look through that course book, there is very little reference to pronunciation. In fact, maybe there's almost no reference I could find to pronunciation or phonology work in the unlock reading and writing, especially in the reading sections. Now, the learners are about to read a text in this piece of material that's like a pre-reading. Yeah? So um, this is a classic stage in many of our lessons which is kind of pre-teaching or unblocking, sometimes called new vocabulary. Um, it happens in, in lots of the material that you're reading. What we're asking here is, how could we help the learners prepare to read the text better? And the course book is suggesting that we could pre-teach some vocabulary, and that's a great idea. It'll help them maybe access the text a little more and create uh, maybe a picture of the text, activate schemata. And from a phonological level or from, from a phonological point of view, we could also do a couple more things. We could maybe focus on the phonology of some of the words in terms of their silent letters. So we could help the learners create a better um, representation of those words, words like government or vehicle. We could also work on things like word stress that will help them to process those words and process the text a little bit faster, according to Catherine Walter and according to all of you who have suggested and agreed that the better our phonological or our phonological awareness, the faster we can read, yeah, the better we can process the text and the more we can gain from the text. So these are things that you might do um, on an ad hoc basis when you approach a text. Integrate a little bit of phonology work before you approach it. Another thing that you might want to do moving back to our idea of student-centeredness and agency is instead of deciding what words the learners will have problems with is asking them or giving them the power to tell you what they need support with so after we've done our traditional work with um, maybe drilling of stress maybe some problematic pho phonemes in there like fuel ooh, you you fuel that could be tricky for learners after that, we're going to move to maybe giving the learners some time to read through those words, practice them themselves. So this is the kind of individual pronunciation or phonology work. And then when they've had some time, we might ask them to raise a hand. We might ask them to use the chat box or we might do a quick poll to find out which of the words they feel they're still struggling with. So the procedure is, do your traditional pronunciation work, give some learners some time to reflect and to, alone with mics off, develop, and then ask them which words they still need some support with. I think this final step is something we very rarely do. We assume once we've drilled it, 
once they've repeated it, that we're okay to move on, but maybe we're not. So this is a small idea you can incorporate. Similarly, you can do the same thing before you do listening. I think intuitively, we maybe are more likely to work with phonology before listening. Before listening, we know that the learners are going to hear the word, they're going to hear the phrase. So we might be more inclined to focus on this phonology. But once again, we, we want to maybe give them a little bit more agency and using us as a resource to help them with the words they really need help with. We might also introduce them to similar words. Yeah, so in these words, maybe in the, um, in the listening lesson below, there are some words here that I, my learners certainly might struggle with, like colleagues. I would imagine I would need to help them with that. But if I ask them, they might tell me some other words they need help with in this set of words. So it's about kind of giving the learners a little bit more power in their own learning. And we have the idea of drilling as being a very straightforward way to consolidate patterns. It is, definitely. I think one of the points here maybe is that when we have a lot of words to deal with, we might spend a lot of time drilling and not all words perhaps are equal in their difficulty for learners. So sometimes giving them the choice of which words we, they want help with means that they can identify and become maybe a little bit more reflective learners, and more in control of their own learning if we ask them to tell us which words they need help with. Drilling is a very efficient tool that we can use in the classroom. Here's another set of um, vocabulary that is related to a receptive skills lesson. It's kind of a classic vocabulary box. What kind of task could you focus on with these pieces of vocabulary in your context? What might the learners struggle with here? Habib, yes, the p and the v sounds, yes, the shun, right? When we're working on individual sounds like shun or p or b, a nice thing to give learners a little bit, again, more individual time could be to get them to take their uh, mobile devices and to turn their cameras on um, or to take a mirror if they have one. Um, and to, after you've highlighted how your mouth is used to produce the sound, then you could give the learners some time alone to copy that in a mirror. Research um, shows that getting that feedback, that visual feedback on your articulatory system is very powerful in helping learners amend or correct or develop their ability to produce sounds. So watching the teacher and um, copying the teacher is a great way, but even better is to get them to look at themselves and to see if they can copy and or if they can use their own visual picture as feedback to help themselves correct the sound and get closer to the sound they're trying to make. Another area with this vocabulary, I think, would be to focus on these things. So I call these stress bubbles, not because they're stressful, obviously, but because they are quite a visual way, I think, to represent the stress of words. Yes, yeah, so Mitchell Gonzalez has said the number of syllables. Um, so we're kind of getting there towards syllable work with this, um, which lots of Arabic learners have problems with, I know. And we're asking the learners to put the words from the box into the category that they belong to. This can be a very quick activity that you do in the lesson. Maybe as you're planning, you notice that the words uh, lend themselves well to a bit of stress work or um, pattern, stress pattern work. And on your whiteboard, if you're in the real classroom or on your um, uh, whatever document, whatever whiteboard you're using, if you're using um, Blackboard, you can ask the learners to work maybe in pairs or groups and categorize the words into their pattern. So the first pattern is small, big. The next pattern is small, big, small, etc. Our first pattern here small, big. Any suggestions which words go in? I don't even really need to ask you, do I? Yes, great, Elizabeth. Okay, how about the next one? Maybe a little bit trickier. What words go into our second pattern? A very classic pattern in English. Small, big, small. Great. Protection, that's right. Tradition, protection. Of course, the, um, the stress pattern for shun words, there is a, a pattern or a predictable um, way that those words carry their stress yeah with the penultimate syllable carrying the stress and this is something you can highlight and develop yeah so using little small activities like this that are in the course book to maybe develop learners phonological awareness beyond just these words yes yeah? so you could get them to, to brainstorm or add more words to the list kind of creating i suppose a hook or some kind of helpful way for learners to develop because 
as we say, drilling is great, but we maybe need to do a little bit more than just drilling in the classroom if we really want to develop that phonology. Then we have our third category, and we have our final category as well. That's a small thing that you can do. It might take you five minutes in the classroom, um, but it requires absolutely no real preparation of materials, just the whiteboard that you put up the, the, the patterns on. Let's move on to our next uh, stage in our receptive skills lesson. If those activities that we just looked at were for before reading or listening, pre, now we might look at what we can do while learners are reading. As we said, learners' ability to pronounce words directly impacts their ability to understand the text. Even if that pronunciation or articulation is not actually happening, we're not reading aloud, they're reading in their head, but if they can't read the word, then their understanding of it is going to be severely, um, of the text is going to be severely impeded. So a classic um, activity in the normal classroom that I would incorporate a lot is that while my learners are reading is I would just ask them to raise their hand if at any stage they're encountering a word they can't pronounce. I'm not talking about explaining the meaning of the word, just the pronunciation. So my learners might be working on comprehension questions or other parts of the text. Um, and if they have any struggles with how to say a word in their head, they put their hand up, I go over to them and I help them. In the online context, that's a little bit more challenging, but I think we can still facilitate that same development by asking them to type in the chat box. As they type in the chat box, we can either say the word to the whole class as they're reading alone, or we can wait until the end of the reading activity and then look at all the words that they've written in the chat box and go through them and provide an, a good, accurate um, and helpful model of pronunciation for those words. So this is not about preparing the learners before they read, but supporting them in the way they need while they're reading. So again, this is going back to the more student-centered approach to teaching and developing phonology. I don't want to pre-teach all the words. I'm going to let the learners make their way through the text, answer the questions, and I'm going to be there to help them when they need me. Okay, let's have a go with a text. I'm going to show you a text um, that uh, is about a friend of mine. The text has some words that you might not be familiar with the pronunciation. They're not English words, they are borrowed from the Irish language, from Gaelic, but the text is in English. So I'd like you to read the text, and as you're reading, to type in the chat box any of the words that you're finding difficult to understand um, or to pronounce, should I say, difficult to pronounce. Um, after you've read the text, we'll check the pronunciation. While you're reading the text, I'd like you to think about who is the text about? So quite predictably, I suppose, um, the Irish words, the words in Irish, they're a little bit tricky for you to pronounce or to represent phonologically in your head, maybe accurately or comfortably. You probably don't feel very confident in how you're saying them in your head. And that's impeding your understanding of the text and also of those words as well. Great. So everyone's identified that there are maybe four or five words in the text that are a little bit challenging for from pronunciation. So if this was a lesson I was teaching you, I would first check the answer about what the text, who the text is about. Yeah, so the text is about my friend, as many of you identified, um, and it's about her uh, accomplishments or what she's achieved. Yeah, a great thing about Siobhan, maybe that's what you would call the a great news for Siobhan. Maybe that would be a good title for the text. So as you've heard, I've already said Siobhan. We're going to do a couple of drilling activities now. Mic's off, you don't need to turn your mic on, where I'm going to help you with the pronunciation of these words, okay? So I want you to repeat, um, either out loud or sub-vocally, or however you like, to help you develop. I don't want mics on for this, all mics off if that's okay, yeah? So the first one will be my friend, her name is Sh, 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 Siobhan, Sh, Sh, Sh. So that sound is important in Irish, Sh. Sh. Can you all say it? Sh. Sh. It's soft and it's small. Sh. Sh. And then the second part is big. Vaughn. Oh. Vaughn. 
Siobhan. This is her name. Is everyone repeating? Siobhan. So we have a small sound and then a big sound. Siobhan. And this is exactly what I would do with my learners as well online. Next, we have the instrument that she's playing. I want you to listen carefully and notice the stress pattern. Is it the same or different to Siobhan? She plays the Bauron. Bauron. So is the stress pattern the same or different to Siobhan? Bauron. Ron. Everybody? Ron. Ron. Bauron. Yes, it's the opposite, right? It's different. So Siobhan is small, big, and Bauron is big, small. So we have Bauron. Is everybody saying it? Bauron. And she is from a part of Ireland called Leash. E, long sound, Leash. Shh. That sound again. Shh, Siobhan. Shh, Leash. Leash. Everybody repeat. Leash. <laughs> exactly, Elizabeth. Yes, they sound really different, which is, I think, learners' experience of English as well. Um, there's a lot of similarities in that surprising phonological representation of things that are written in English for learners. Yeah, think about lots of words like bought, caught, those kind of words. Yeah, we have a lot of that issue in English too. And then the competition she's playing in is called a fla. Ah, can everybody say ah? Big open mouth ah. So we'll pause that activity there. But I think the idea is to summarize is that we help the learners um, with the tricky words in the reading after they've read. And then we would ask them to go back, read it again, and maybe we'd ask them to reflect do you understand the text a little bit more now? Does it feel more comfortable to read the text? We could use questions like this to help them reflect. So maybe I'll just give you all a few, a few seconds to read the text again, now that you know how to pronounce those words, Siobhan, Bauron, Leash, and Fla. Yeah, silent, exactly, Aladdin. We can look at the silent sound of the, D, the, the silent DH at the end of Fla. Can you read the text again? Do you feel more comfortable with the text? Do you feel more fluent as you read it. Great, Wafa. Yes, Abdul Karim, it's a great question. Abdul Karim asks, does the reading of these words help comprehension? The answer that Catherine Walter's research and that I think intuitively from the classroom we all have is that yes, if the learners can't read that word in their head or a word comfortably, if they can't identify what it sounds like, then their overall understanding of the whole text, this is Catherine Walter's um, research, which is really interesting, not just their understanding of that word, but the whole text's understanding is impeded because they can't map that word accurately to the phonological inventory or the set of sounds that they have in their head. Yeah, and this is kind of very interesting and would support more phonological work with reading skills than maybe we already do. That's what we're talking about here. And especially since so many of us do a lot of reading um, activities with our learners, um, depending, of course, what course they're on. It's something that we can help. Yes, Abdul Karim, yeah, we can guess the meaning. Exactly. We can, but we can't guess the pronunciation. Or sometimes we can't. And some learners aren't very good at guessing pronunciation. That's the point here. And they need more support with it. They need more help to pronounce and to work on their phonology. Uh, the researcher, Mitchell, is uh, Catherine Walter. Exactly, Elizabeth. Really good point. Elizabeth says, I think it breaks up fluency so their focus gets interrupted. Yes, also this. Yeah, so it sort of interrupts their, their processing of the text, their reading. No problem, it too. Okay, so let's have a little look at um, a final activity for receptive work, which is related to post listening. And so we're going to have a quick look at a post listening. Um, activity or moment, phonology moment that we could have um, after listening work. Um, the 
idea here is that we complete the material in the course book. Maybe the course book is doing some gist, some detail, maybe some inference. I noticed in your course books that, yeah, in the unlock series is often like some watching of material. So we're talking about any processing. It could be watching or just audio from the like English Unlimited series. And what we're looking at here is the um, idea that sometimes the learners can't get the answers to the questions. They just can't get them. Or sometimes they they feel dissatisfied with the listening. Uh, maybe they did get the answers, but they feel like they say things like, I didn't understand, or I don't know what he said in the beginning. But these are kind of things that I often hear my learners say. So we're going to take an example from my learners, which is a listening lesson, which was about um, the life of animals in the forest. So forest animal life, a kind of nature related listening. It was a kind of lecture type material that they were listening to. And after they had answered the questions, one of my learners um, who got all the answers correct said, what did he say about whales? Why is he talking about whales? They don't live in forests. So this learner had heard something about whales in the listening and couldn't let go of this idea. Yeah, so um, I was able to help this learner and we can help learners with problems like this by using what's called pause transcription technique. So let's have a look at what that involves. So um, I identified where in the, in the text the learner had the problem. Um, I sort of knew a little bit what they were talking about, but there was no, there were no whales in the recording. Um, so I, I found where the problem was in the text, and I asked the class to listen again um, to just three seconds of the recording, maybe four seconds of the recording. Yeah, so not much. We're talking about a very small amount with pause transcription. Um, it could be 10 seconds, but no more than 10 seconds for pause transcription work. So what you're doing literally is you're pausing the recording after a stretch of language, after a stretch that learners haven't understood, and you're asking the learners to write down all the words that they hear. This is transcription, yeah, exactly the words. The learners completed this task, and my learner who had the problem said, I heard, did he say the animals hide a whale day? This is what he heard when he listened. Now, you might need to play that small stretch of recording three, four, maybe five times to be able to help them. Yeah, so Sarah has already jumped in to find, to answer the, the problem. Yeah, so Sarah, Sarah, as you, as you note, I, I think I knew what the, what the speaker was saying, but the learner was still hearing, and lots of the learners in the class were hearing this a whale day. So I said, that's not exactly what he's saying. Let's look at the sentence. So these are very simple things that you can do. It's a very simple thing with some simple questions to help learners focus in on what they're hearing and not being able to map, what they're not able to map. So um, the, question, the questions you might use to support pause transcription would be, what do you think you heard? Yeah. So when the learner says, I, I didn't understand something, you can use this question to tease out what the problem is. You can also use the task of listening and writing down. This is transcription. And then you need to look at why they're hearing that. So as Sarah has already identified, what was being said was the animals hide away all day. But my learners were hearing a whale day. So we can look at this part of the sentence, a whale day, and we can work on the connected speech. There's lots of things happening. There's assimilation, there's catenation, there's some elision, lots of things are happening. And it's really, really important for learners developing their receptive phonology that we don't just give them the answers here, that we help them to develop that. So we let them hear it, we focus on the words, and eventually we go back to that recording and play those four or five seconds and help them hear now the animals hide away all day. Yeah, so that's right, Ella, you are mapping to what you already know. And if you don't know it, it might interfere. So maybe the learners didn't know hide away as a, as a phrasal verb. Absolutely. Yes, Mitchell, exactly. <laughs> I used to work in Spain. Mitchell says it's like when you say to students, first of all, exactly. Um, and the learners here, best of all. 
when I worked in Spain for a long time, this is exactly what they heard all the time. They thought I was constantly introducing lessons about festivals um, when I wasn't. So I know exactly what you mean, Mitya. Do you have this problem as well? Yes, I think we all have these things no, uh, in our teaching that we notice the learners. Exactly, Samina. The L1 has a major, major influence on how the students perceive their words. OK, so um, I'm going to just move on a little bit swiftly. So we have a couple of minutes at the end, possibly. What we've talked about so far is receptive skills, listening and reading. But also we've talked a lot about vocabulary. There's been lots of sounds and work with words so far. So what you're already doing with vocabulary as a vocabulary phonology work, I think maybe I'm suggesting you do a little bit more of that with receptive and um, listening and reading lessons as well. So we'll, we won't go into too much more detail on phonology with vocabulary. And we'll move on to the final part, which is thinking about productive skills. I think in most of our books that we work with, productive skills are often related to maybe some grammar or vocab that's been taught. But sometimes productive skills can be just speaking fluency development in itself. So here's three very small things that we could do to help our learners with that more productive phonology, if we've been looking more at receptive so far. Um, OK, so uh, in your English Unlimited course, there's lots of really already nice moments, nice phonology moments that are incorporated into the material. These include things like um, linking, highlighting linking sounds. You can see this material here is about linking consonants and vowels, so catenation, what might be called catenation, um, which is a really nice thing to develop awareness of with your learners. And your course books at the moment, English Unlimited, are kind of full of this, this material. So I'm not suggesting that you don't use this material. My suggestion would be from a, a developing phonology is that you keep using it, but maybe you want to um, add a few tweaks to it. Um, as we already mentioned, you might ask the learners which of the sentences they're struggling with the most. And you might ask the learners to practice these sentences on their own rather than as a group, mics off. And you also might focus on some other drilling techniques. I'm sure everyone has heard of back chaining maybe. Um, back chaining is when you start at the end of a sentence and then you add the words backwards to help the learners develop their ability to get their mouths around the phrase. So you might say something for the first one here, you might start with place and you say place and then everyone, and then you add unusual place and everybody says unusual place and then very unusual place, very unusual place and so on. And you move backwards through the sentence. And back chaining is a very effective way to get learners to stop thinking about what they're reading or what they're saying and just focus on the sounds. So goes the theory. Um, here, I'm suggesting that when the problem is something like intrusion, liaison, um, catenation, which lots of people in the chat have mentioned, thank you, Samina and Allah, Adin, Adin <clears throat> the place to start might not be the end of the sentence, but might be in the middle of the sentence. So we might want to start with the problem area or the intrusion. For example, here in the first sentence with our drilling, we might want to start on the S. Let's do some mid-chain drilling. And we're going to start working from the middle and adding the other parts out. Mike's off, can you all repeat? S. Severi. Severi. It's severi. It's a very, it's a very unusual place. It's a very unusual place. OK, so this way we're focusing on the linking part. Now, when you do this material in the course book, obviously you have some nice tasks here where the learners listen, they practice and they repeat. But sometimes we overlook the difficulty they might have with that small part of the pronunciation, that linking part. So let's say, there are other things that this might work well with, like questions like j, do you j, maybe this is the focus. So just that sound might be really problematic for learners. So we're in mid-chain drilling, we're focusing in on the difficult part and then we're adding outwards from it. Another idea that I think works really well in the online context, but it can also work in the face-to-face -face classroom, is focusing on questions that are presented in the course book. So in English Unlimited, there's lots of moments like this after grammar has been practiced. Um, it could be whatever the grammar point is, there's often some kind of questions because questions are a nice communicative thing to focus on. And this task is really important because it focuses on um, weak forms in question forms. And it could also focus on things like assimilation. 
So it could be things like, would you, would you like me to record? And weak forms like, can you? And do you? And are you? Yeah, so again, I'm not saying not to do this activity. My suggestion is you do the activity exactly as it is, but maybe you pause between A and B. Well, actually you pause in part B, it says practice saying the pairs of words on their own. So this could be the learner's practice on their own, and then they practice asking the questions. Now that's great, but they're not getting much feedback on how accurate those questions are. And one thing I like to use in my classrooms um, is Google. So my learners all have mobile phones, and if your mo learners have mobile phones, to get feedback on are they being understood, so this comprehensibility aspect, they can ask Google. Um, alone, mics off, get their devices, switch their Google to English, which is very easily done in the settings and something you might do anyway to get learners interacting more in English. And they have to ask Google the question. Now, if their pronunciation is good and if they are able to produce this, the question comprehensively, Google will understand. If not, they will see what Google is understanding and they'll have to modify their speech to attain more comprehension from Google. And so this activity succeeds when they see on the screen the question on Google, audio, the question that they've asked being represented on the screen. What I find with this activity is that learners really enjoy it and there's an element of fun to it because Google also gives an answer, doesn't it? Um, and it's a really simple thing that we can incorporate um, to boost that comprehensibility side of things, especially when learners are working individually, maybe with cameras off, mics off, but they still have their device in their hand. And we all know, I know certainly how much my learners are attached to their devices. So it's nice if we can use them and exploit them. Our last idea is that we're going to do a little bit about preparing for speaking. The idea here is that when learners are preparing to speak, and we want them to do some speaking, sometimes we throw them in the deep end. And throwing in the deep end is great, but sometimes if we want their pronunciation to develop, and pronunciation being a ma major component of speak the speaking skill, we might want to give them a little bit of preparation time. One thing you can do is if learners are about to speak, for example here, this is a speaking activity following a bit of grammar practice with the present perfect, they could do this. You ask them to put their mics off, and using their phone again, um, instead of asking Google, they're going to record one of their sentences that they've written for this speaking activity. For example, it might be, I've always wanted to write an elephant, but this is their sentence, something they want to say. They record it on their phone, and then they listen back to themselves. This activity of listening back on themselves and reflecting and noticing can help them develop like a kind of ear for their own English. And if they don't like it or they're not happy, they can record it again. The recording doesn't go anywhere, it's just for them. But when they're ready and when they've had their preparation time, just not just writing their sentences, but also rehearsing them, they move on to the speaking task. And the idea here is that they've automated or automatized the language, the sounds a little bit more. And so they're building a little bit of fluency with what they want to say. They're not stumbling or thinking too much. This activity is a couple of minutes that you incorporate before learners speak. And it can add to really big payoffs. The learners in the speaking activities tend to feel more confident and they tend to be able to elaborate a little bit more if they've rehearsed. Yeah, This is especially great for lower levels, but I wouldn't discount it for higher levels either. At high levels, the, the learners can also gain a lot from preparing what they want to say. Yeah, We're not going to ask them to read it like in the, in the speaking activity, but the rehearsal time allows them again to internalize, get their mouths around those phrases that they might want to incorporate, that more complex language. And the pronunciation there is again, being supported and aided by that practice time. 